told that the first month, in that one month, there will be both the outpouring of the former rain, which is Pentecost, and then the latter rain, which is seven times greater. That makes eight the number of New Life. So I think we really need to get our fishing net ready. Amen. By the way, I told Dr. Ed yesterday, I said, God doesn't use line fishing except when he's taking up the offering. He said to Peter, go down. They, they wanted to pay taxes. He said to Peter, go down to the water, throw in a line. It's the only line in Scripture. And he said, you'll find money in the mouth of the fish. So if I ever come and start taking up an offering, I'll bring a fishing pole. All right. I want to talk this morning from Isaiah 58, uh, actually verses 6 to 14, but we're only going to use to verse 12, because I believe God has given me a message that has come even stronger since I've been here. And that is that we are getting ready for God to restore some things. And number one, this house. On. Okay? Yeah. All right. So let's... This. Here's the rationale. There are some of the instructions that we're going to consider that have natural interpretations. The fast of the Lord, many have just done the natural thing and not understood that there's a very much deeper meaning. When he was saying uh, that... that uh, we need cuisine. He's seasoned. I'm spicy. All right. <laughs> Here's an axiom. There will always be some level of spiritual interpretation for, in Scripture. There may or may not be a literal one. Okay? The second axiom is this. If there's a literal interpretation, don't do away with it. There are some that are trying to do away with the literal interpretation. I uh, fellowship with a group of people at one point who did away with natural communion. And as I watched them, I realized they didn't have the full significance even of the spiritual meaning because they'd done away with the natural. I believe God's a God of balance, natural and spiritual. We need both to be well-rounded in God. We use the natural illustration progressing to the spiritual interpretation. God may speak that there, are some, there is not spiritual interpretation. But until he does, assume there is one. In other words, there's at least, I often say there are at least three layers to Scripture. The outer court, the holy place, and the holiest of all. And the holiest of all brings you into the most intimate of all understandings. That's where God wants us to go. The literal is always a shadow of reality. Now, I have this wonderful light in my eyes, and if it was big enough, you could see a shadow behind me. If I was standing on a corner, and, and, and you were coming up to that, and you saw the shadow, you could follow the shadow to the reality. But how many know the shadow is not even the beginning of understanding right. the reality? And so we need both types and shadows, but we also need to follow them to the reality. God's called us to reality. Now remember this, the Bible is a spiritual book written by a God who is a spirit to a spiritual people. So we're going to talk about the aspects of this fast of the Lord, but we're going to deal with the spiritual realities than something else. In Isaiah 58, 6 and 7, is not the, this the fast that I have chosen? By the way, this fast is in three phases. We're going to deal with two this morning. Okay? And, of course, I always put everything in the light of the tabernacle. And so some of you will enjoy that and like that. But that God has dimensions for us beyond anything we know. Okay? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself, this is one we don't like, by the way, from thine own flesh. So let's just talk about this, just give you some... 
when I started the ministry in Kingston, Ontario, um, I started a church there and pastored it for 20 years, and we called it Kingdom Seed. And this morning I brought some seed. And if I can get you thinking, I've accomplished it. In fact, if I can get you frustrated enough to search the word, I've really accomplished what I've come to do. So I come with a big seed bucket, and I hope you come with a pen and paper, okay? To loose the bands of wickedness, bands put on us by others, or legalism. To undo the heavy burdens, Jesus said of the Pharisees, he said to the disciples, do what they say, but don't do what they do, because they put burdens on you too heavy to carry. Jesus said, my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If there's a burden, he carries the major part of it. He wants us to loose people from the heavy burden. Undo them. I've been sometimes ministering to people in the spirit, and the Lord says, undo the heavy burden. So I go around them as if I was taking a backpack off their back. I have just a quick story. I lived in Christian community for five years, <clears throat> and we went to the trap line. Now, on the trap line, you take a canoe out, and then you tramp some, portage, and then you go on another lake. And we had these wonderful, wonderful uh, cabins way out in the middle of nowhere. I mean nowhere. We were north of the northern Canadian line, the rail line. We were up there. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm 110 pounds at that time, so I've gained weight. <laughs> the, the backpack was 45 pounds because I had to take Strong's with me. Because I'm the type of person, I can work all day, but if my mind keeps going, I've got to get it tired. Hello? None of you like that, I know, but... <clears throat> There's some nights I don't sleep because I didn't get my mind tired enough. Okay? So here I am walking and 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 we're we're walking out. And they told me we have to walk across the ice, so I put on snowshoes the first time I'd ever had snowshoes on. And I'm scooting across the ice, and that's fine until I begin to go up back up to the land. And what happens is I fall over backwards with a 45-pound pack on my back. Guess what? They had to help me up, but they could hardly do it because they were laughing. And then I went down the other side of the hill and fell on my face. They had to undo the heavy burdens. All right. Let the oppressed go free. The oppressed are bound and captives. God's going to bring in many in here that are oppressed. They're not necessarily possessed, but they're oppressed or they're in depression which is one of the greatest things that's hitting the earth today. Even the Christian church, people are depressed. God says we can set them free. Right. That's part of the fast. And that you break every yoke. Destroying the yoke is imperative. Not just breaking it. Some, uh, at the farm, they had some oxen, and they could repair the yoke. He wants to destroy the yoke. That means it can't be put back on. Hallelujah. And to deal thy bread to the hungry, both naturally and spiritually. There are some who are so spiritual, they can't bake a loaf of bread and take it to a friend or take it to someone they need. We need to get involved in both because, you see, if you feed people, they'll listen to you. Hello. That's very practical gospel. But we need to do both. Not just feed them naturally, but get them so hungry because of the love we emit that they want what we have. Amen. That thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. We were talking yesterday, and, and uh, Dr. Ed asked Kelly, what's your ministry? She said, hospitality. Now, some are given to hospitality, and some are given to hostility. Come on. <laughs> And we get the two confused in the church. We are not the elect of the select. 
we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And unless we are, we don't really realize what we've been rescued from. I often tell people, I was a greater sinner than any sinner out there. Because I was like Paul, a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And it's harder to save a Pharisee than it is a sinner. They live in the house of the I'm all right. <laughs> when thou seest the naked that thou cover him naturally and learning to cover with love because love covers a multitude of sins. Here's the key. See, when, when Jesus taught the par parable of the wheat and the tares, what did he say to do with the tares? He said, leave them in the field until the time of harvest. But we've tried to pick the church clean, and we have wounded the wheat. He said, leave them there until the time of harvest, lest thou disturb the wheat. God's going to bring people in here that you may not like. They don't fit within your framework. Tough. Get used to it. He's going to send more. Why? Because the tares manifest the difference between tares and wheat. Tares are full of knowledge. You know why? Knowledge puffeth up. And the tares in the harvest stand straight up in the wheat bows. We need that. What happens, though, is the Holy Spirit does the undercover work. I remember I was brought up in a legalistic church, and we had rules for everything. Of course, by the way, a legalistic church will always pick on the women. Come on. It will. We could wear short sleeves, but women had to have sleeves down to here and dresses down to their ankles, and this, you know, high, take three hours to do the hair, but they had to have it long. And I made the mistake of asking them how much pride went into their hair. <clears throat> but God wants us to learn. One day, one day I'm fighting, you know, the Catholics are getting the baptism of the Spirit, and I'm getting upset because they weren't supposed to be it. And the Lord said, if I'm filling them with the Holy Ghost, you better move on. Hello? He'll fill who he wants. I think in one sense, he put Peter's nose out of joint when he filled Cornelius without him being baptized. Oh my, in the wrong order even. Are you hearing me? God's going to do things that we don't expect in ways we don't think are right. But here's what Peter, Peter was smart enough to say, if He's filled them with the Holy Ghost. What prevents them from being baptized? When I said that to God, he said, Bill, I want you to read again what I said about the Holy Spirit. Why has he come? To convict the world of sin. Oh, you mean that's not my job? There goes half, one third of my preaching material. Of righteousness. Oh, you mean I can't set the standard he does? There goes another third. And he said of judgment to come. You mean I can't preach on hellfire all the time? I had to learn how to preach all over again. Hello. Let's let the Holy Spirit do his work. And let us us provide an environment where he can. Amen. That thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Be real. Admit your flaws, asking God to change you. And by the way, if you admit your flaws, they might help you pray through them. All right. Isaiah 58, 8 and 9. Then, a time word. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thy health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee, and the glory of the Lord shall follow thee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I like it when something follows me that's good. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he will say, Here 
Oh, Amen. Result of the obedience to phase one. Then shall thy light, not his light, arise, shine for not his light. Do you mean this little light of mine is going to shine? Why do we save all those nice courses for the kids? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thine health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness, not his. See, when I appropriate his, it becomes mine. When I let his light come in me, it becomes my light. When I appropriate his healing, it becomes my help. The glory of the Lord shall follow you or be thy reward. Thou shalt call and the Lord won't wait a week to answer. I mean, the Lord will answer. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. Well, what are you? I am whatever you need. Isaiah 58, 9c to 10b. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, from the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity, and if thou draw thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, destroy the yoke among you by allowing the anointing to move. Because it's the anointing in Isaiah 10, 27. It's the anointing that destroys the yoke. I used to quote that break the yoke and the Lord said, look closely. I use the words I want to convey what I want to convey. And if you break it, that's not enough. The anointing must destroy the yoke. Yeah. He's going to do that by the spirit of might from Isaiah 11 and 2. The spirit of might is God's warring anointing. And God wants to clothe us with his anointing that will destroy yours. And then number two, stop the blame game. The wife thou gavest me, she. Oh, no, no. It's that snake in the grass. Eve said. When I don't face my own, I can't get rid of it. He said, we went through a, a section this morning in our, in our service of confession. If I don't confess it, he won't take it away. And folks, I don't need it. So stop the blaming. Humble yourselves. Stop boasting, even in our spiritual accomplishments. Now, I move a lot among the prophetic people and apostolic people. And I listen to them boast, and something in here is like nailed. Some of you will get this reference, some of you won't. Nails on a chalkboard. There's a screech in your spirit. And sometimes I can't put my finger on it, but whenever that happens, there's a screech in my spirit. As long as I have to tell you it's him, there's not enough of me in him, him in me. It says they shall see your good works and what? That can't be Dr. Red. I know him. All right. <laughs> Humble yourself under the mighty hand of, a, of God in 1 Peter 5 and 6. That's my choice. Humbling is my choice. Extend your soul, your will, mind, and emotions to the hungry, both naturally and spiritually. How many know you can eat lots of food and still be hungry? You can be hungry for love. You can be hungry for joy. You can be hungry for peace. God wants us to satisfy, extend our soul to those who need help in their will being healed, in their mind being healed, in their emotion being healed. And, by the way, give them something to eat too. Both naturally and spiritually. By the way, if someone has been on a long fast, you don't give them steak. You might need to give them soup. 
to them, that's better than steak because they'll probably bring the steak back up. Discern what they need to eat and give them what they... Paul said, I condescend to men. He didn't say I'm condescending. He said, I condescend to men of low estate. In other words, I get down on their level so they don't think I'm greater than they are and I relate to them where they're at. I remember being in New York City, Bible school. I went to the city and they didn't know what to do with me and I didn't know what to do with them. <clears throat> I was a country bumpkin and here I was in New York City working on the streets. And uh, one night they decided uh, to, they needed, uh, the, the Bowery Mission needed a piano player. I got there with the piano player, because you always send a, a, a man with the, with the uh, ladies. I got there and they said, oh, the speaker's not turned up tonight. Would you speak? I had never, never even been near a Bowery. Hardly knew what it was. I just knew that they needed somebody and there I was. And I said, God help me. So I preached a message on the word and gave an altar call and people came to the altar and you know, like a good little country bumpkin, I stood back here like this and said, Lord bless them. The Lord said, no, go up closer. So Lord bless them. He said, no, get down and put your arms around them. See? And I got that and God did a work in my heart showing me where I was proud that I didn't think I was. But he also did a work in them. Because very few got down and loved them. Comfort or satisfy the soul going through affliction. In 2 Corinthians 1 and 4 it says, Comfort others with what? Oh, you mean I've been through that before? And it's equipping me to comfort others. Everything you have been through, everything God has brought you through is equipping you for the day of harvest. Isaiah 58, 10c to 12. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity. Then, the time word. And thy darkness, anything that's dark in you will be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee spasmodically no continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters fail not and they that shall be of thee shall build thee always places and here's the phrase the Lord gave me for this house thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of paths to dwelling. So let's look at this and I'm just going to give you seed thoughts along the way. Then shall thy light rise in obscurity from the unknown to the known. Obscurity is unknown and unappreciated. Then shall thy light rise from obscurity. Thy darkness shall be as the noonday. There's another scripture that says the darkness shall be light to thee. The Lord shall guide thee continually. I put here all the short forms. Holy Ghost GPS. <laughs> In other words, I will never be without knowing what to do and how to get where he wants me to go. Yeah, oh, Lord, help us. How many want that? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He'll satisfy thy soul in drought. The illustration came to me of when there was a famine and Abraham planted seed. Nobody else had a harvest, and he got a hundredfold. God wants that for this church. Praise God. And make thy bones fat. Now, it must be doing something right. Because <laughs> you see, I'm not. 
<laughs> Better recover from that, right? <laughs> then shall thou shall be like a well watered garden. And if we had time, I would go into Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verses 12 to 16, where the beloved describes her as a garden. And we talked about, Ed talked about cuisine this morning. When you look at that garden, you know, when we think of the harvest of God, we've got this very narrow concept. But in chapter 6, or chapter 5 of Song of Solomon there, in the first verse he says, I am come into my garden. Then he names his garden, my sister, my spouse. I have eaten of my eaten of something. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Come eat, O friends. The husbandman first partakes of the fruit. Then he invites people into your life. By the way, he invites the people you don't. In other words, he might invite some you might not want in your garden. And you're going to be like a spring of water whose waters fail not. Out of your innermost being will trickle. River? Rivers. Cindy, are you back there? Yeah, you are. I think so. Anyway, um, one day I, I was talking to the Lord about the rivers. He said, there are seven rivers. I said, no, there aren't. By the way, I do argue with God sometimes. He's always right, but I argue. He said, well, then study what Scripture says are rivers. <coughs> and there are seven rivers in Scripture that can flow out of our innermost being. And they're all related to the tabernacle furniture. Just a seed. And they, <clears throat> they that be of these shall build the old neglected places. Talking with Ed, when he came here, there was some need of repair. Because there had been neglect. Not because of anything except there wasn't enough people to, and finance to do what's necessary. But you're now rebuilding the old waste place. So there's going to be reproduction and restoration. And thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. And I'm going to go into this one in the next slide. But it starts with revival. By the way, revival is not to bring in sinners. You can't revive something that wasn't vibed in the first place. <clears throat> well, we <clears throat> told you I was spicy. All right. <laughs> Thou shalt be called the repair of the breach. There are holes in the wall. Okay? And the restorer paths to dwell in. They have become overgrown. Let me just flesh out very briefly with, with some illustration here. Thou shalt raise up the foundation of many generations. God translated this to me when I was reading it said thou shalt raise up the foundation of many denominations and I said huh he said every denomination that started in a move of God will have God visit them and restore to a remnant within that revelation that ignited that move they represent therefore go back to the Lutherans the just shall live by faith. It will come alive again. The Anglicans, the Anglican Church Army, the evangelical wing of the Anglican Church. Now that's the Episcopal down here. But they were the ones that did most of the mission work. I attended one of those churches in uh, Kenya when I was there. Solid, solid salvation message. Wonderful bishop. The Methodists, the definite second work of grace. 
the Nazarenes, healing in the atonement, Christian Missionary Alliance, missions and healing in the atonement, the Pentecostals, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the nine gifts. God's going to restore every one of those foundations. And there's going to be a move of God such as we have never dreamed of. So let's draw the conclusion. Although there is a third phase, and we're not going into it this morning, the word of the Lord this morning is get ready for God ignites fires in every gem generation that was started by a revelation from heaven. That added to the body of our understanding of God, his will, purpose, and the understanding of his word. He will ignite a revival of or remnant in each one of them that will emphasize again the truths upon which they were founded and a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in each one drawing people to himself before he comes. It's our responsibility to begin to pray into this promise asking God to revive the work in the midst of the years. Habakkuk 3 and 2. O oh Lord, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known. And in wrath, remember mercy. Hallelujah. This gives tremendous hope for the years ahead. Hallelujah. God's going to send a revival so that every revelation of himself to his people will be emphasized and celebrated by a people. Because. Let me close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your mercy. We ask for a release of your grace to believe you for this deep work you desire to do in these days. Thank you for making our hearts hungry. We ask you to prepare us for and bring us into this fast that you've chosen. Help us to do what we can naturally to walk into it. Help us see how to perform the natural aspects so that many are blessed. Also, we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us into the spiritual realities it represents so we can see the release of revival that is promised and see these foundations reestablished and the breaches filled and the repairs made. In Jesus' name we pray.